Uh, my name is Xiao An. Uh, Fetz Institute is a private foundation in Michigan, the United States. We have been working very closely with the Global Purpose Movement community for several years now. We sponsored the uh, inaugural summit in San Francisco last year. Uh, in case you're wondering what FETSA is all about, uh, our mission is to help build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. Let's just pause a little bit. A spiritual foundation for a loving world. I like to break that down a little bit. For a loving world, which means we, we shall be more loving, caring, and forgiving with each other as a way of being. Then the spiritual foundation is the inner peace. What is calling us to be more loving and caring? I'm a Christian myself. I hope it's fine to share that with you. Then in the Bible, they has it. Uh, you, I'm, 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 I'm supposed to be more loving, caring, precious, you know, practice self-control and patience. It's because of the connection with the Holy Spirit. Doesn't matter what you believe. We believe it's essential. So when Irvin talking about Cosmo has an ultimate purpose, that ultimate purpose is calling us an individual purpose. Why during a sermon about purpose, we like to talk about democracy, which is the number one priority at the Fetzer Institute right now. Why? How democracy and purpose connect. You know, I travel often, I travel often in Europe as well. I had to take taxi. The taxi drivers, they are very real, they are honest. As soon as they learned, oh, you are from the States. Wow, you guys have a crazy president. Well, I hate the politicians in Europe, in my country too. They share a lot of times. I want you to, to work with me, point and finger, everybody. Point your finger to someone right now. Can you do that? Just point your finger. Do we notice when, whenever you point a finger, you have three other fingers pointed back to you. Let's just pause it for another second. When we talk about democracy, we tend to focus on too much on politics. We focus too much on the politician. Do you agree? My personal approach is somewhat different, and the Fetzer Institute also approached that differently because of this spiritual foundation. We probably all agree the world in the, is in a democracy crisis right now. That's definitely true in the United States. More than ever, everybody's talking about democracy as a crisis. As soon as the election happened, the Christmas, the Thanksgiving dinner in the United States two years ago now, the family, the parents, the grandparents, they were struggling. They did not, they didn't know how to, how to say because the family members voted for a different person. They felt the family is falling apart. That's the same thing in Berlin right now. You have the left, you have the right, you have the blue, you have the red, you have the liberal, you have the conservative. You are on the different sides of the key issues that you believe are essential to identify who you are. You believe you are right. Let me ask you another question. When was the last time you really listened to someone who actually looked different from you, who actually voted different from you, and who actually think different from you? When was the last time you listen with your whole being? Let's pause for a second. Question is very simple. When was the last time you listen to someone with your whole being, someone who's quite different from you? Okay? I will share three quotes, then I will end this. Fetz believe the democratic crisis right now can be fundamentally understood as a spiritual crisis, a moral crisis, and a relational crisis. Terry Tempest Williams, my favorite American author, she said, 
the human heart is the first home of democracy. It's always here. Jiang Dewey, another pioneer philosopher in the, in the United States, he said, democracy is and should be a way of being. I will end my sharing a little bit with President Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest leaders of all time. He said, in 1938, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedom, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Pretty heavy stuff. I guess you are ready for the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so I just want to presence the, um, the noise outside. As I understand it, there's a protest happening um, by members of the, um, the LGBT community here in Berlin uh, in relation to military service. So welcome to Berlin. <laughs> this, is, this is, you know, this, uh, yeah, everywhere. So, um, yeah, we'll move on to the politics panel. So please do come up. Nicole Bogot, uh, Nick Jankel, Pam Kramer, and Martin Michaelis. So just introducing this topic, I want to get you fired up a little. So in my experience, I've, I've run some stuff around politics in the past, and it's my experience that uh, people can either switch off really quickly or switch on really quickly. <laughs> and the switch off comes from a place of disempowerment, and the switch on comes from a place of the fact that underneath the surface, the surface of the politics conversation is a whole big thing around power. And I've been amazed when I've run some stuff around politics in the past, how fast it can go there. So we're going to have a conversation here. Um, and actually, I did that with Martin, so it was a, a real pleasure. Um, we're going to have a, a conversation here for the next kind of 20 minutes to, um, to kind of 30 minutes in which I'm going to ask these guys some questions. Then also I'm going to invite them to be in communication with each other. But then I want to open up the last 20 minutes for audience questions. So as you're listening to the content of what happens here, Please fill into what you would like to add, what you would like to ask, how you would like to contribute. Okay. So, um, to, get us, to get us going, I would like to ask each of you to just say your name and, and speak about the work that you do and how it relates to the conversation to do with the future of democracy and purpose in politics. Hello. Um, hello, everybody. So my name is Nicole. Um, I mainly deal with uh, power dynamics in the international context um, on various levels. Um, I developed a model um, by which we can um, foresee or measure or um, analyze power. Um, it's called the Power Triangle Model, together with um, Dr. Branko Wojtyl, who's not here right now. Um, basically, what we found out in our research is that power um, is comprised by three different elements. Uh, one is the access to knowledge, the uh, second one is the access to networks, and the third one is the access to resources. And within all of these three elements, um, you can, depending on how you look at it, whether you look at it from a government perspective, from an individual perspective, or maybe from an organizational perspective, you can see various different aspects. Um, I'm also co-founder of an initiative that's called IMPACT. Uh, we started in Afghanistan. Um, we connect high-risk um, environments, um, especially looking at startups and social entrepreneurs um, to each other. And um, yeah, that's it for now. Thank you. I think it's afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pam Kramer, and I'm from the San, Fran San Francisco Bay Area. I steward a practice, um, so I major in practice. It's integral transformative practice, and uh, it emanates from Esalen Institute. So the co-founders of Esalen Institute, uh, Michael Murphy, and actually George Leonard was sort of the 
third co-founder of Esalen Institute, developed a practice to uh, empower individuals to be their fullest self. And it uh, rests on a number of different elements, theory, practice, research, and community. So I've been engaged in this practice as a practitioner for the past 18 years and serve as the president of the nonprofit organization. So we have groups that have formed in different parts of the world and actually a workshop happening in Bordeaux in a couple of weeks uh, on this practice. And as it relates to our topic today, um, I'm really interested in personal empowerment and the kind of capacities we as individuals can cultivate um, to create a more peaceful, um, loving, and joyful world. That's why I'm here. I take this. It's on now. You're on. <laughs> I'm on. Yeah, my name is Martin Michaelis. Um, thank you, John, for inviting. Uh, I worked um, as a political mediator for the foreign ministry and the EU for five years um, in crisis uh, regions and conflict zones. And uh, two years ago, I stopped that because of diverse reasons. One of it was that it was kind of Sisyphus work. I don't know whether you know the word Sisyphus. Um, so it was not that successful, I would say. And um, that's why I changed and moved to organizations and smaller systems, uh, work as a consultant in organizations and municipalities, um, supporting them, um, building, creating different work cultures, um, which can shape a successful and more peaceful future. And uh, today I would like to address some issues about uh, what is the situation right at the moment in Germany and in Europe regarding whether people are kind of able to live their purpose. Um, so what's the conditions? And also, um, how can we build um, a system? Uh, how can we prototype political system in which purpose um, plays a role? Thank you. Um, so I'll start with the most practical area that I'm interested in this topic. Um, the first is, as a, someone who does leadership work, um, I think the group of people who we call politicians are probably the least likely to have a, had any access or requirement to do any form of significant or deep leadership work on themselves. And yet they're making the decisions that affect all of us based usually on, I want to still be here in four years, uh, and I want everyone to like me, uh, which is all about that protector uh, decision-making process. So for me, it's an urgent need uh, to provide uh, some form of leadership development work for politicians in Germany, England, America, everywhere. And so that's something that we've actually been talking about uh, over the last couple of years about how we do that. Um, so that's one really urgent thing that I'm very passionate about. Second thing on the, on the back, the individual level, again, about personal empowerment, um, when Nietzsche said, God is dead, um, launching us into the Enlightenment and the idea that there's no morality outside of our own relative choices. So how do we make decisions that affect the whole if we can't live with a certain rule book that God said, this is the, this is the rule book, which creates a crisis for how we make decisions. Uh, is it better to buy uh, a, you know, a, a green car or no car? Is it better to uh, eat meat and not fly or, or not eat meat? And these are all really tough decisions to make that we all have to make on a very basic political level. And for me, helping people understand where they make those choices from and how to make choices from a, what we might call a, a spiritual, interconnected, intuitive decision-making process rather than some kind of external morality is super important to us all. Otherwise, we just can't even make the most primary decisions that affect us all. Um, and then maybe the most, uh, the deepest level, which is an area that I've been writing on a little bit and starting to really get deeper into is um, that we live in a, essentially a political system that was born uh, in history two, three hundred years ago, um, which pits left wing versus right wing. Um, I think it's redundant. I think it's out of date. Um, it's historic, not essential. 
Uh, and most of all, they both come from a separatist worldview. Um, the same mistake that we are separate atomized material beings. And one flipped left, one flipped right. So for me, it's how do we take the best of a right wing energy, um, let's call it self-reliance, the best. Self-reliance, empowerment of, of, you know, do your own thing, make it happen, entrepreneurship, creativity. Uh, no one's here for you. And with the best of a left wing, the urge to make things equal, to make things open, to make things accessible to everyone. And I don't know what that politics is called, but it's something that I think is, is massively urgent today. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I want to just drop the question in. So what for you is the relationship between purpose and politics? What could be that relationship? Is that even useful? What, where would that go? And what kind of democracy would that have us arrive at? You know, what, what kind of political structure, what kind of governance structure would that have us arrive at? So is there anyone who wants to dive in? I'll dive in. Thank you, Pam. I think it's really important um, that we do a full examination of our lives and notice um, what we're called to do. And um, from there to ground that in, uh, because I'm so oriented on practice, um, a, an integral approach that cultivates the whole person. And from there, um, there's kind of a natural um, uprising of energy and a sense of liveliness that occurs that also helps uh, us express ourselves to others and inquire deeply to understand them. So there's a balance of inquiry, and I'll call it advocacy. Um, and in there, um, there's uh, um, uh, a tendency to minimize that separation, but to create more of a sense of oneness between self, other, and the world. Thank you. Okay, um, what I would say to this is that um, one of the important things is uh, to really see ourselves as citizens much more than uh, perhaps we do, and also as part of um, society and really asking ourselves uh, what is it what we do, maybe on a daily basis or weekly basis that really contributes towards society. And that is closely again linked to the notion of power. And I think people need to really familiarize themselves in, as individuals with that concept of power, whether you're male, whether you're female, it doesn't matter. Power in and of itself is neither good nor bad. Power is just a tool that you either have or you don't have. And I think and before we maybe look out, um, we, we had the pointing fingers, what everybody else is doing or what the politicians are doing, or this is also very important and it's also um, part of being a citizen. But I think it's really about self-empowerment first because that is a bit scary. <laughs> because if you have power, people look at you and people like we're sitting on this panel maybe and I'm saying something and people might, everybody has a different thought now about what I'm saying, if it's boring or not. Yeah, you put yourself out there and um, you take responsibility and you stand for something. And that is again very much linked to purpose. You put yourself out there, you're taking power, and only by taking power you can challenge power. And that is a very, yeah, that is politics basically, in a nutshell, right? And that is also the way that democracy can work, by many different people accepting that they do or don't have power, and then think about what that means for them and what that means for the world. So that's uh, my contribution. Um, nice question, Tom. Um, and uh, when I think about uh, when I was in Bosnia Herzegovina or South Caucasus and um, talking to people there and um, trying collectively to find solutions for their um, conflicts they had, whether it's bordering conflict, conflict between ethnicities or just the war which just happened in Georgia before in 2008. And no one really was talking about purpose. Why? Well, you could say that they had such a strong protector, 
But I would say just before um, they took care about a protector, they had such a extensional needs which were not satisfied. So I think and I wish that politics basically takes care that we have life conditions and not just here because I think for me it's a luxury to talk about purpose here. Um, and I think not many people all over the world have the luxury to do that. I think um, politics um, should take care that and there are life conditions that people have the space to sense into their purpose. And um, following my own experience, it's just a very little um, group of people all over the world. So the question is, um, do we have here in Germany, because that's the closest, right? Or in Western Europe, that's very close for me at least because I'm from Germany and I know the bordering countries. Um, do we have the conditions here that um, people can, if they have not yet, um, take care about their purpose and f try to go on the journey? Um, and um, I think that is in danger. So I think um, that uh, there are strong control mechanism um, anyways in the conflict regions because in the conflict regions there's conflict because uh, lots of politicians don't benefit from the peace, they benefit from the war. They benefit from controlling people, um, not finding their life purpose, instead um, watching TV, go shopping, if there's a shopping mall and it was not destroyed, it's hard now. Um, can, I, can, I, can I ask you about that, Martin? Yeah. So, because I, I want to take you deeper here, because I know, so there's a lot of people who can, you know, a, lo a lot of perspectives get thrown around about politicians and governance institutions a lot of the time, right? Martin has worked on the inside of these systems. So I'm interested to ask you, like, can you say a bit more of that? You know, you've worked with politicians. You've, you've done individual work with politicians and you've worked in these areas where there have been multiple conflicts going on. Is that, is that really your experience? And can you say more about that? I, I will come to that, yeah. Um, but the question was, um, why are not these life conditions there for purpose? And I think politics needs to take care of it. And we here in Germany, I think we have a new cabinet in which, for example, Horst Seehofer sits in as a Minister for Internal Affairs. Well, Horst Seehofer is uh, responsible for the latest uh, change of policy laws in Bavaria. And these policy law, uh, not policy, police law, um, has uh, a wide range of power for police um, to control and to um, open them chances to prevent crime, right? But this law goes so far that um, we haven't had anything sim uh, similar since the Third Reich. So surveillance, and laws change into this direction. That means that our situation here, from, from, politic, from a political level, they tend to have a stronger control. Why is that? From my experience working with politicians, of course, many of them, what I know, they started working in politics uh, in order to gain some power, uh, in order to express them, and um, also to do something good and to change something. But the system is not in a way established that the purpose to care about the people in a way is most important. Why? Because the system heads and focuses on a capitalistic approach, right? You mentioned that already uh, in your um, thesis before. And capitalism kind of companies are the strongest influencer of politics. And um, I know a few uh, parliamentarians here in Germany who try to get out of this system, yeah? not function, not following the um, fraction discipline, so-called, so not ruling with the party. Well, do they have any chance to be elected for higher positions within the party? No. What I would like to address is, of course, that um, we need to take care that we have the life conditions, and not just here, also in other parts of the world, to find and to search for our purpose. And therefore, we need to include in our own purpose to ensure these life conditions. And that is the opposite of 
supporting control systems, I would say. Thank you. So, and Nick, so do, do, do go. I can see you're ready to I'm go. Riff. Um, that, but amazing. can you can you address this topic as well? So you, yes, you gave us absolutely. this distinction. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One, that's something I've been dwelling on a lot recently that I think would be a whole day of its own. If everyone has the space and the basic needs met to explore and live their purpose, does that work? Who collects the rubbish? Like, really practically, right? Is that a possible desire and uh, just practical possibility. My heart says absolutely. My head goes, huh, interesting. Uh, is purpose a middle class thing? Right? So that's something I'd love to talk about, maybe not in this topic, but at some point. So in terms of purpose and politics, I'm gonna, if we talk about, for me, purpose as a euphemism for love in action, what does a welfare system look like that's driven by love in action, not ideology? Very interesting. What are policies policing policies that come from love and action. I don't mean a fluffy um, kind of love. I mean a fierce love of a parent. I love you, you're perfect, and you've stepped out of line, that doesn't work, sorry, boundaries, consequences type love, fierce love. What, it, what would it design if, we're not, if we give up ideology and instead we take purpose or love? Um, what does a party politics look like that's not premised on, well, I'm a socialist, well, I'm a conservative, uh, but ah, I believe in the moment by moment emanation of intuitive wisdom to tell us what to do next. That's guided by connection, not separation. What's that politics look like? Again, something I've been talking about with people. How do you formalize it into the, this political system so we can actually have some of that power you talk about rather than just sit on the fringes, uh, you know. And then the third thought, which is, okay, citizenship. So I don't know if you guys have heard of Thomas Paine, probably some Americans have. He actually wrote a book in the town I live in Sussex um, called Common Sense, which went on to really accelerate and amplify the American Revolution. And in it, he calls government a badge of lost innocence. Because he says, were our consciences clear, we would need no others to tell us the rules. We would need no others to tell us how to divide things. And this is like the libertarian urge. And I'm a libertarian in some ways. I believe I don't want the government telling me I can't take psychedelics to de develop myself. That's insane, right? But true libertarianism only works if we are all doing relentless, rigorous practice so that we can discern what's protection, what's connection, what's mission, what's purpose, what's love, what's actually love twisted by my need to be liked, etc., etc., etc. So what does that world look like when we're citizens who, who are doing so much work that we can actually use things like blockchain, et cetera, to do direct democracy rather than representative democracy, which one might argue isn't democracy. So those are some of the things I think that are important around this uh, topic. Thank you. Nicole, <laughs> did, you, did you have something or can I, can I bring it to you? I can bring it to you? <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay, so, um, so we're, we're in this exploration of systems that are based on control and, and, um, and dominate. They're, they're not kind of life positive systems in a certain way. They're, they're based on safety. And they regulate power in particular ways that maintain, a, maintain the structure that we currently operate within. And then there's also this kind of possibility that is in the field around uh, systems that are based on thriving and purpose. From your work around power, how does that land for you? Systems, you're saying systems that um, are based around purpose versus systems that are based around protection, something like this? Yeah, like safety, safety and control. So safety and control. Yeah. Mm. It's a very broad question. You mean where are these systems in Germany? Do you, do you think it's possible? You know, you've, you've done deep studies around this topic of the way that power works on an international level. Yeah. Do you think this is, uh, how, how is this? How a shift is possible. Kind of how thing? it's possible, is it possible? Do you, mm. How do you feel this could happen, if it could happen? Mm. You know, I actually had two thoughts over there. Maybe it will also ma match if I don't uh, cover this. Maybe, because it's a bit of a broad question. But um, I, I want to challenge you, actually, on one of the things that you said. And then I had a thought also 
over there. Sorry, I'll go back to you. No, it's good. Challenge each other. I want, um, I, I want this. This is good. Okay. So basically, you were saying um, politics or politicians should be in charge of providing basic needs um, to citizens so that they can fulfill their purpose, if I understood uh, correctly. Now, I think it really, this is very context specific. I think in, in, a, um, in a theoretical framework, I would agree with you. In a I think it would be ideal if, a, if politicians could care for every single individual. Um, however, I mean, I've just lived uh, in Afghanistan for one year, and there it's just um, very difficult for the government to provide to all of the citizens, and there are various reasons for this. And on the other hand, um, you also have the international community that also has a lot of problems providing, you know, the basic for the basic needs and services. So now um, what's happening um, in that specific con context is that there's um, um, a more non-traditional actor that we're looking at and that's entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs that are you know, um, Afghans that have skin in the game, that know where the needs are, that are close to the community, um, that can perhaps also be a, a new actor um, alongside the traditional, more traditional actors that we know to provide services. And I think in Berlin you have a very similar trend where again this ties into the whole idea of citizenship and participating uh, in maybe more economical ways towards contributing towards um, certain things that the society needs which would meet the purpose. So I really think maybe that also fits then to your question. I think a way forward is to think, to find the fine balance between acting in an economical way, I mean you've touched on this as well Nick, but then also understanding yourself as a citizen of a larger group and I mean oftentimes this is also labeled social entrepreneurship where you have a or you're trying to find a balance between looking at what is needed in the community which is purposeful but then also have it you know, do it in a sustainable way where you do look at your balance sheet, exactly, where you look at your time, the resource part, right, where you look at money, where you look at human um, resources and so on and so forth. So I think w once we start acting more like that, um, I think that would be very beneficial. And then also for the democracy part, uh, you said direct democracy is perhaps better than um, a representative democracy. I'm a fan of liquid democracy where you as a citizen can choose whether you're supporting, whether you want to vote every four years like we do now. Maybe you're not interested in politics. Maybe you don't want to be so much engaged so you can give your vote to a representative. But you can also at some point take it and you know vote directly on the issues that you care most about, not to have voting fatigue. Um, but voting, I think, is very important, but then also acting, uh, seeing yourself more as a citizen entrepreneur. Does that also relate to the question, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, um, I think uh, you didn't understand me correctly. I couldn't make my point. <laughs> no worries. Um, I don't think that politicians are directly responsible for satisfying essential need of citizens. I think that they should aim on supporting citizens to uh, live or have life conditions which can serve them in the best way. And um, from my experience, uh, the majority of who I met and the conflicts speak uh, a different language. It says that a uh, majority uh, takes care of um, own power, maintaining own power, do whatever is needed to maintain that and um, correlate with the people who has the m biggest power and at the moment these are some big conglomerates and they don't care that much about the needs of the citizens and my wish is that it's opposite and um, how to do that I agree completely with you that um, we cannot follow and um, and um, trust the institutions that they will change it. Why? Because the system they live in and they are heavily depending on, and that's why they want to maintain the power within the system, serves dif differently. Yeah? They serve the good of some on the back of a lot. So how to change it? Yes, civil society 
needs to take over a bigger role within the political system. And um, we see it all over the place. Uh, companies like Google, they're doing politics heavily. Maybe not the politics for all the citizens, but they do. Yeah? So there are different actors now uh, involved in politics. And entrepreneurs, um, social entrepreneurs, like for example, uh, Cairo University, um, who are taking care of education of refugees, like in Jordan, also here, they have a political mandate so on. Not because the citizens addressed it or voted for it, no, because they kind of went into the space, which is here, which is there, because of the disconnection between institutions and citizens, and just did it. And uh, that's what I think is definitely an, an important thing. And how can you do it? Uh, how can you bring purpose into power? Um, I'm not sure whether it's successful yet, but at least it's an example where a municipality who asked me to support um, or facilitate a leadership program um, started a different way with me with the question, how do you guys as a municipality want to shape the future of your municipalities and the citizens who are living there and who pay a lot of taxes? Yeah, that was the question. And then they wanted to get out of it. Why? Because they were impatient and they wanted to follow up with the leadership program. But I said, okay, you, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to start with a leadership program without knowing in which direction you want to head. And I think this is the question we all need to ask ourselves. What's the future we would like to have and what can, how can we contribute to it? Yeah? And in the moment when they earnestly asking themselves, it was clear that the way how they approached it was not the way how they would like to. And there we came with self-management and purpose, mm. for instance. And uh, we are working now with the municipality with, with these two questions and peu a peu starting to implement it in little groups and prototyping it. So this is one little step, but it is in politics because municipality is part of the political system, right? So I appreciate that. Thank you. So an example of how that can, how that can work. So just before we um, open it up to the audience to ask questions, um, I want to reserve the last 15 minutes for that. So if your responses could be as, as cutting and razor edge sharp as possible, that would be fantastic. Um, what is the role of the citizen? You know, what is, what, what is my role? Like within, within the, our desire for a more purposeful engagement with pol politics and, and the future of democracy? What is the role of everyone here? Should they be interested to explore that role within the framework of politics? So, Pam, can I begin with you? Absolutely, I, I think that each of us has um, an inherent responsibility to um, notice what's arising in us uh, in, in the form of a contribution um, to the world. And um, so I think as a global um, society, we all individually and collectively have responsibility to contribute. So bringing forth our greatest gifts, knowing what they are, um, focusing on our purpose, um, and then um, moving it into action I think is, is most important. And I feel like we have entered a period of time where we're kind of at a crossroads in some of these themes that, um, that um, Nick was uh, bringing to mind in terms of intuitive wisdom and those sorts of uh, capacities that we haven't been trained in this. Um, that these are um, promising ideals, um, but I would like to see more um, within the the educational framework um, contributing to this so that we can develop a deep listening, a presence. Um, uh, so as we move forward, there's some tools that we have available to uh, bring our gifts forward. So that's my answer to your question. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'll speak for myself as a citizen. If I was teaching a younger version of me who was all caught up in Marx and Mao and fire and change. The first one is, I am no good to anyone until I've done some healing on my own heart. Um, because everything comes out as the wrong kind of power and it's 
protective of something and it's, uh, it's messy and it's unclear. So well, number one role of citizen is you've got to do some work yourself so you have any sense of what your own purpose is um, and where you get triggered into the desire of power, the desire of liked, likingness, et cetera. These, when you get triggered into the fear of what you're going to lose if you stop eating meat or if you have to give up some of your livelihood uh, to let some immigrants have something. So that's job number one. I think then that goes, okay, now, so now I've done some work on myself. I can't just sit in a retreat center, staring at a wall, smiling beatifically. I've got to go into the world and do something. Um, it's time to act. Um, and you're never going to have the perfectly healed heart to be clear that all your actions are super pure and beautiful and gorgeous. You're going to make loads of mistakes. So you've got to get in action. You've got to start experimenting. And I think then the third level is, is being mindful of the current system and going, OK, I've got to go and stand out there on the street if I believe in this thing. It probably won't do anything to the system, but that's what I've got to do. I've got to go out and stand, be a stand, make some actions, make some choices, do some petitions, pay some money to these people to do something, whatever. Whilst also going, I know within me, there's a, within us, there's a bubbling of a new system emerging. How do I support uh, different forms of democracy, different forms of party politics, different forms of um, political system thinking uh, with new technology, etc. So that we're, and it's tough because we've got to be here, social entrepreneur, doing my own thing, making my money, livelihood, contribution. I want to go and contribute to whatever's going on that I f feel is my thing. And I need to also be part of the birthing of this new thing, otherwise it ain't going to be birthed. Um, and that's a lot. And that's why we go back to the number one, which is without that self-care, self-transformation, it's very hard to hold all those things uh, together. Thank you, Nick. Um, for me, the first uh, to do is, of course, as a citizen, to be connected and to be connected to myself. And when I'm connected to myself, then I can connect to others who might be completely different because when I'm connected to myself, I don't fear the differences of others less. So then I'm able to connect to someone who's uh, voting for the AFD, for example, because they're also just people with fears. Then I can connect to people who has an understanding of the world which is so far away that I couldn't believe it, but still I can listen to them. And I think this is really important to see and to accept the diversity and being able to see maybe own fear, but can transform but still following and connecting with them. And that is what, I don't know the name who talked before about it. I think that was uh, he was addressing. And the second, uh, second thing is to be concerned as a citizen and to take care. Um, in, my, in, in, in my community, there are many friends who, who try to get out of politics and escaping into the private life, uh, making money and it's good. Yeah, and politics, okay, others take care of it. Yeah, others take care of it, but in which way? Um, and as he, I addressed the example of Horst Seehofer, um, I'm really afraid, I have to say, I'm really afraid that um, Horst Seehofer starts initiatives in the German parliament with um, police task laws like he did in Bavaria, and not enough people go on the streets. And by that we have a law which is, uh, is illegal with our constitution. Um, and these are exact the moments when we have to take care of it and not to wait that others do. Thank you. Nicole. I liked what uh, you said already, um, action and connection. I totally agree. I think um, the ideal scenario for citizenship is really to uh, create alternatives to what we criticize. Um, so it's important to see what doesn't go well. It's important to point out, okay, I'm afraid of this. This doesn't go in the right direction, doesn't align with my values. But we need to go a step further and think, okay, so if this doesn't work, what do I support? Is it something completely new that I come up with? Is it somebody else you know, already in that space? Can I support them? Can I support my friends? Can I support other people? I think this is also very powerful. Um, we need to, if, if there's no better alternative, then what we have is the best that we have, you know, and then also complaining about it 
it only goes so far, right? So we need to be a bit smart, I think, and innovative, basically. And action is a very important one. Thank you. I'm going to move to questions, so just, just for time. So are there anyone, is there anyone in the audience who has a question? So we've got a few. Um, oh, I'm going to use this microphone. You have a question. I don't, have, oh, I don't have a question as much as I have something I'd like to presence. Um, with the question of what can I do as a citizen, I've just been, I want to bring it down on a feeling level because I've been sitting here for the entire time that I've heard you talking and my heart's beating and like I feel really nervous and sweating and my mind is interpreting this. And what comes to mind is I'm a person born in Germany and I have experienced how power and the illusion of like a good purpose has gone horribly wrong in the Second World War and how big ideas of um, basically also spirituality, a longing for something bigger has really been misused in part by the politicians to make people go with this movement. And so when I think of democracy, I first think of um, national democracy, my own nationality. And I feel something that's so dear to me as I'm feeling my body's responding is the healing component of every single nation um, about what has happened in the past and how power has been and purpose has been misused so that as I can speak about me as a German, I can even connect to the word purpose without my heart like basically telling me that's wrong, be afraid, one array, don't make yourself big, and stay in this kind of flat land um, that we have in our democracy. Right? So I'd love to see my nation and other nations really connecting also to the healing um, of the past to have a good and healthy foundation to then source um, meaningful purpose that can actually serve. Thank you. Thanks, John. I uh, love the topic. Thank you. I do have a question, kind of related to that bodily response. Me too. I'm curious, do you know of, or are you aware of any experiments worthy of further inspection? where people are experimenting, living laboratories, if you will, for alternatives to politics as a tool to distribute power. Where is this being experimented with? Like micronations, intentional cities, that kind of thing. Um, I know of an example in the city of Mostar. Uh, Mostar is a city in Bosnia-Herzegovina and in the Yugoslav civil war, uh, Mostar was heavy damaged because the Croat and the Bosnian Muslim ethnicity had strong faults. Um, there, was a, there was a peace agreement called Date Peace Agreement, and uh, it ensured that um, the city of Mostar would, with the two ethnicities still fighting, not with violence, but with words and with politics, um, couldn't really govern the city because it was divided, right? And it's too small to have two cities in one. So it's a huge misuse and nothing is really going on. So what did some people do? Um, in a little part of the town, I mean, the town has maybe 50, 60,000 people, right? Um, they, it was a quarter of the town. It was a mixed quarter, so Croat uh, Muslim ethnicities mixed. And um, what they did was they sold just, just to their neighbors their, um, their um, uh, goods and um, they, their food. So they took care that just within this little quarter um, they could survive. They didn't go to the administration anymore. They didn't take care of a passport. They didn't take care of anything which was related to the outside world. And they called it something like utopian Mosta peace. So they separated heavily and took care of the existential needs within and had a certain um, 
had a certain cultural um, structures to, to, to maintain a good, good um, behavior, or let's say, medi they meditated and stuff, right? But um, this is a nice experience of, uh, to get rid of this uh, nationalism which was surrounding them, but of course it was separating. And um, if you ask me, is that an example I wish for in the future? It's not, because I think we need to go towards opening and not separation, and towards a we culture which um, embrace everyone. And they didn't do that. So it's not as, as nice as I would like to have it, right? I can't Just read your name tag. Uh, I'm trying to so hard. What's your name? Jeff. <laughs> Great. Really love what you said, because healing on the personal level, I'm just going to come back to that, because it's very interesting. When I look, walk around London, and I see all these beautiful buildings, all, all I really see is colonial subjects who have been, who were enslaved for three or 400 years, creating value that was then made to build, build these huge uh, buildings. When I go to America, I just I can feel the, the genocide of uh, Native Americans and slavery in every conversation, it's there, present. And we're really good at creating ceremonies in na national nationalism, which I think is a redundant thought these days. Nation state uh, is, is also an out of date concept. Um, but we're very good at creating ceremonies for creating uh, sort of positive ideas of the good. But we're very poor at understanding how to do ceremony or ritual around healing what, what didn't work. And until we heal slavery in America, um, colonial stuff, the wind rush, whatever in the UK, what, you know, obviously stuff here, until we do heal that at that level, it's going to be really hard for any one of us individually to really create that shift in any of these places. I really appreciate that, that embodied yearning uh, for some real completion. So, so just as much as you or I are no good to anyone until we've done our own healing work, so also in the collective. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? So right at the back, I'm gonna run over here. So I think we'll take this question and then one more after this. Thank you. I will be uh, very quick, at least I will try. Um, we've been talking about politics and for me, uh, politics starts with the education. And from my perspective, uh, um, so I come from Poland and I was uh, attending public school and what, like, what I feel now at the age of 30 is that f for those, I don't know, it was 15, 18 years, I've been um, disempowered, like I've, I've been being disempowered um, on the way so that somebody could have the power on me. And uh, so what I now do, uh, what I'm now doing is to start thinking how to give the power back to people, giving them some tools, knowledge, and attitudes that are needed. My question to you is, like, from like each and every of the fields where you work in, what are the skills, attitudes, and knowledge that is needed for the people to be powered, empowered as human beings and afterwards as citizens. Thanks. I can, I can start um, with uh, responding to this question because it's really aligned with the whole notion of our educational system and um, developing particular capacities to be effective in the world. Um, and starting with the whole big field of communications, um, you know, cultivating the capacity to listen deeply uh, which is uh, a very complex uh, skill set. Uh, and from there, um, to inquire and to um, build um, some kind of collective relationship with another. Also, the worldview that uh, without our uh, common uh, connection, uh, how, how is it that we can prevail as a global community? So we, we require that kind of worldview. So I, you know, there are a number of institutions that are working on these sorts of things. And what I was going to say before, John, is that working in uh, corporations over the past um, 35 years, years ago, uh, we couldn't even talk in this way that we're talking now. Uh, to bring love into the equation, it, 
you know, so I had to be very secretive and, um, you know, couch my language. And now um, what I'm noticing is that love is, is prevailing. It's uh, a, the common uh, kind of universal language that at least in the circles that I've been in. Um, and I see this as very promising for the world. Um, so on the relationship side, I think that's really primary that we cultivate, um, as I mentioned before, the deep listening, and then also a presence within ourselves. Because if we can't um, uh, notice what's alive within our own being, these feelings that you were sharing, which I, you know, I felt, uh, I could feel you. I could feel our connection because you were able to share at that deep level. So I think for us to, as human beings, to, to notice what's possible for us and to um, gain a greater awareness of our capacities and then to express them uh, skillfully in the world. So those are just a few uh, ideas and I've got a list uh, waiting in the wings. Thank you. Uh, again, I can shortcut. I've spent many years putting together a curriculum for what I think the 21st century human is if you go to uh, switchonnow.com slash inspiration, um, there's a leadership map and curriculum with six sort of big areas, and then it goes detailed on what I think a leader needs, and therefore by, I mean, for me, leadership work is just what we didn't teach kids that we should have done uh, because we were so busy teaching them, teaching them geography. Um, and uh, actually, my wife uh, is working on a, how do you take that kind of, high-level skills and qualities, purpose, collaboration, dialoguing, listening, co-creation, innovation, prototyping, all this stuff which is so important. How do you then backtrack that into the education system so that when you're five years old and upwards, you're learning how to dialogue and listen and, and conflict transform rather than uh, you know, what happened in 1783, which is also very interesting, uh, but not necessarily vital. Maybe, maybe additionally, um, I think that's behind all what um, you two already addressed is that um, people grow up, kids grow up and know they matter and every life matters. And uh, that means an inner connection, of course, but also that means that they have the space to express themselves. Uh, me as a person, I didn't have it and um, um, so I got involved with all this yeah, with all the work, of course, because I try to find out whether I matter or not. So let's check that uh, we connect to the people and to ourselves that uh, every life matters. And if we live this way, then a we culture is really easy to achieve, right? And then it's very easy, of course, to um, tell some people who have a different uh, strategy or would like to control that that doesn't matter yeah we still can do it <laughs> <laughs>